Hello guys and welcome back to another episode of Bearham Engines. So today guys, two things. One, we're gonna show the effects of not having the correct clearance on a crankshaft. And two, we've got a very boring couple of days ahead. Right, so I've bored the first bore of the, um, or the first barrel for this Harley and you can see visibly how much bigger that is than that. So obviously they're, I expect they'll have to use a different head gasket, but yeah, that's um, pretty much half inch bigger. So all we've got to do is hone two thou out of that one, um, set this one up and get chomping away. But it basically takes about almost two days of these barrels being on here, so um, quite time consuming. But um, yeah, let's get this one set up and get chomping away. Right guys, apart from stripping two engines in the last day or so, Isaac has, well done mate. Um, just down this end of the workshop, I've been boring barrels all day, still doing them Harley ones. I'm on my last cut of that Harley one and we've got a load more on the floor to do here, including that one, I think. Uh, so what we're doing down here, I'm just honing this barrel. There's two Harley barrels to, to um, hone here. There's only eight thou to come out, so I'm just roughing the majority out and then just finishing them, waiting for that one to cool. But over here, I don't think I've even showed you this, very exciting, but this is our pressure test rig. Um, so Isaac has got what looks like a Volkswagen head on here um, and we're basically pressure testing it um, to make sure there's no cracks. So the idea of pressure testing a cylinder head is if it gives um, like pressurising symptoms or head gasket symptoms, um, you take the head off, mainly on the diesels. If it doesn't give clear signs of the, the head gasket blowing and it's been used in water, um, then it's, it's a suspect crack, especially in, in the, one of the ports. So the way we do this is we sit it on our jig down here um, and use, use these contraptions here to put um, sort of pads over the water jacket. Any external water jackets we have to block up with plates like this. We just glue them on temporarily um, and then cover the, the surface water jackets with all these pads and do these up so they're all tight and then we force air in about 100 psi through one of the water jackets so we then turn the air on you can see it's not 100 percent sealed but there is plenty of air going in there and if we turn turn this jig over so the ports are upwards and then pour water down the ports. I won't do all of them. You can see that one there, which is an inlet. There's no bubbles whatsoever, but if we put one in there, look, you can see, you can see those, that bubbling nicely. So that means there is a crack in one of the exhaust ports. Isaac, turn this off. So Isaac has checked them all, they're all good except for this one. So we have got um, a crack in that exhaust port there. So that is how we pressure test the head guys. We obviously clean it, get it nice and warm um, with the air escape in there. You normally, it's very hard to get it completely sealed, especially with 100 PSI going through it. Um, but yeah, that head is scrap. You cannot repair that. It, the crack could be anywhere in there. Um, so that is a new cylinder head, unfortunately. Well, I do apologise, guys. It is very noisy in here. Um, there's a lot going on. But I have had what's called a boring couple of days. <laughs> so I've bored, I think, 10 barrels so far in the last couple of days. Um, I've got a, an MGB block to do in a minute. But for all you motorcycle guys out there, just wonder whether you recognise what this cylinder head is off. I'm going to give you a second to have a little look at it. Yes, it is a GT750 kettle engine, and apparently the kettle nickname comes from the fact that it used to boil over. I don't know how true that is, but um, it may well be true that they used to suffer with overheating. Um, we're just facing this cylinder head, and as you can see, we've given it one cut, and I would have thought that that nickname is fairly true, because this one is bent like a bit of a banana. So. Just giving it a four thou cut here. I've already given it three, so that's seven thou, and it looks like it may well clean at this. Um, we've got the barrels outside that we've bored. Well, I think the barrels are already done. Let's have a little look over here. Ooh. So 
So here's some barrels here. I've got a set of Harley barrels that I've done um, to just point, I think that's 20 thou over. And these are the ones that I've done to half inch over. Um, these are the pistons, the wise codes for the Suzuki GT750. I think Isaac's got the barrels. Where's the back? Oh, there they are. So there they are, guys. A, quite a distinctive look of these air-cooled set of barrels. Well, sorry, water-cooled. Um, I do believe that these were sort of one of the first water-cooled two-strokes. I may be wrong, but don't know a great deal about them. But you can see there the selection of ports everywhere, which makes them makes honing them fun. Um, but yeah, so these are for a guy called Mark Taylor, who does quite a lot of these old two-stroke motorcycles. He's got a lot of the smaller two-stroke stuff, Japanese stuff, absolutely loves them. And I do believe he's got about 16 bikes. Um, and while we're on the subject of old air cools that are a nightmare to home, let's go over here. And this here, I don't know whether any of you can recognize this. This is a Mako 250. And you can see there the very distinctive um, set of fins for the air-cooled barrel. And inside these Makos, the 250 not so bad, but they are an absolute maze of port, especially the big 490s. Um, and you've got to be very careful when holding them that a stone doesn't get stuck in one of the ports and cause catastrophe. Um, so just got to be very, very careful. But yeah, Mako back in its day, absolutely wonderful machine um, and I think it won quite a lot and a lot of guys use them these days in the classic motocross so um, yeah it seems to get quite a lot of the old Makos believe it or not so stop that machine now you can see there guys 7,000 and that has cleaned and all back to original and ready to overheat again. <laughs> no. Right, we've just got to... Um, I think we're just going to set these barrels up and give these a face over because as you can see, these have been vapor blasted uh, and you can see on the surface, there's a lot of sort of blow holes and I should imagine this is going to be pretty much the same as the cylinder head. Probably going to have to take off about five thou on that, but we will soon see. Right then guys, thumbnail and title time. So, I'm gonna be sort of going through a couple of things in this little chapter, um, all to do with crank bearing clearances. One is, you hear us going on quite a lot about um, bearing clearances on the crankshafts, whether it be the main or the big end in particular, um, how we come to a conclusion as to what bearing clearance we wanna run, um, and also identifying an engine that's gone wrong um, and why it has gone wrong, how we set about identifying the problem really. Um, so what we've got here is a piston and rod and a crankshaft. I'll just show you this down here. This is just an old crank that we've had lying about and a piston and rod out the same motor um, where something drastic happened. But um, yeah, it's, I'm just using it as an example. So on this one, as you can see, all the big ends have gone. Um, they've all seized up and all the mains are okay. Now the piston and rod, um, obviously it's done all the, the ends. Um, this thing basically seized up after a short period of time and we had to strip the engine just to identify what we thought had gone wrong. So first of all, how do we choose the correct clearance on a, on a big end and that with plastic gauge and obviously um, measuring so first of all i'm not going to go into too much depth with this because I've, I've obviously i've showed you a sizing rods and what we you know what we do there um so with a crankshaft if it's a standard crank or whether we're grinding it we always measure the journal with a micrometer um in the book and we compare it to the book sizes so when i say sizes i mean that there is all there's a tolerance on everything so there'll be a tolerance on your Say, for instance, we, we use a, a big end. Um, so that would be the big end there on the Comrod. So the Comrod bearing clearance. So we measure the journal on the crank. Um, there'll be a top and bottom limit. Usually the limit is about half a thou to sort of 0.6 of a thou. Um, 
the same will be on the housing for the Conrod. There'll be a, also be a sort of, uh, let me think, so usually it's a, yeah, it's usually about half a thou on that tolerance. And then you've also got a tolerance on the bearing thickness, although there's not a lot you can do about the bearing thickness. Um, some manufacturers of bearing, like King Race, not a lot of people know this, but they do, say if they do a standard size bearing, they could be three different grades of thickness on that. So we always measure that just to check. And that is one reason why we, even though we've checked the, the size on the crank, check the size on the, the com rod. We always plaster gauge after. Um, I know plaster gauge is like a little, can be a little bit vague, but it's always a good indication as to the final running clearance um, of the, what you're running. So first of all, we measure the crankshaft. Um, if it's a competition engine, let's use a Cosworth, for example, um, depending on your oil grade that you're gonna be running um, and the power output of it, we tend to know, now this is a, we sort of tend to know what clearance we're running compared to what oil we're going to be using. Um, so it's a bit of a, there's no set rule for this. It's a sort of whatever works sort of thing and what's um, just through experience really. Um, because the crank journal on the big end of the Cosworth is quite wide compared to some. I mean, some are fairly narrow, like three quarters of an inch. Um, the The journal thickness on the Cosworth is quite thick. Uh, we always run a thicker oil when it's hot. So I'm talking about hot temperatures here. So standard, you'd run a 1040, um, but we tend to run a 1060 or a 1050, depending on the application. And that means you can run slightly bigger running clearance, which makes it freer with the thicker oil. Um, if you're running a thinner oil when it's hot, you tend to close up the clearance slightly. Um, so what we generally do, we know that works on the Cosworth is the, the big end journal on the crank. We tend, if we're grinding it, we'll grind it onto bottom limit, so that means on the smaller size. So that could be about half a thou smaller than the top limit. Both are still in um, the manufacturer's spec, but we tend to run it on the smaller side. Then we run the, the Comrod housing on the big side. Um, so that would be the bigger clearance. And then with the King Race bearings that we use, we know we're gonna end up with about two and a half thou of running clearance which we know that works with the 1060 oil on the Cosworths. They generally give a spec, it's a bit like the bore clearance, a bit like the ring gaps, um, as we said in the video the other day. They tend to, middle of the road would be a thou of running clearance for every inch of crank journal size, okay? So if it's a two inch crank journal, they recommend two thou. On the Cosworth, it's very slightly more than two inch. I think it's 2.1 something or other. Um, so we tend to run a two and a half thou, slightly bigger, gives us leeway. You find that the Comrod housings on the standard Cosy rods, not only do they go oval, like I've said before, they're usually on the tight side. So we can usually true them up by putting them on top limit, um, taking about half a thou out of there. It trues them up so they're no longer oval and you're getting a, a true sort of housing on the top limit. And with those King Race bearings, you get about two and a half hour running clearance. That works with the 1060 oil. This crank in particular, you see that it's seized all up on the other big ends. So when we strip a motor, there's sort of three things that can make the, the, the big ends go. There could be, well, more than that. There's obviously lack of oil, oil pressure, oil flow, oil grade. Um, there is also the journal size, whether it be too big, it could be too small. Um, and also then we tend to first look at the piston because we can have it where if it's a direct injection engine, um, the spray pattern even, if it's a, a, a faulty nozzle on the injector, the spray pattern can put excess load um, and cause an end to go. We've had that plenty of times. We had that on that BMW M3 um, a while ago. And obviously you can look for any detonation, any sort of heat seizure around the piston. That can tell you a lot about how the injector has been, uh, could have played a part in this. Now with this engine in particular, we've noticed that all the big, all the main bearings are good. 
um, but all the big ends are knackered and seized up. And obviously you can see where it's been running hot here. Although, so what the first thing we do, when it's all of them, as opposed to one or maybe two, we generally suspect, if the piston crowns are okay, we generally suspect a clearance issue. Um, so first thing we do is we see if we've torqued the rods up and we see if what they measure, um, providing it hasn't spun a bearing in there. Um, the conclusion we've come with this engine here is someone has made a mistake. So this is another lesson here. Um, the Comrod housing on this top tolerance, it's 52 mil to 52.012, okay? Now what someone has done here, I think, is they've, instead of 012, they've gone 52.12, because these housings on three of the rods measure consistently four thou bigger than they should do. So what the problem is here, with this particular engine, you're gonna be running something like a 540 oil, um, so not as thick when it's hot, bear in mind this was a track car, not as thick when it's hot as a say 5 or 10, 40, uh, sorry 60. Um, so this is going to be more reliant on, you, you'd want to run these clearances a little bit tighter. Um, so on this particular journal you'd want to run about a 2,000 running clearance. These have ended up 2,000 plus that extra 4,000, which is the difference between 0.12 and 0.012. Okay, I'm sorry if I've lost you here with all these measurements, but that is the conclusion I've come to. Someone's honed these out. You probably find these are running five or 6,000 running clearance, which is gonna be fine to run in, um, but it's not gonna be fine when it's obviously running and the oil's up to temperature and there's excess load. What that's gonna do, it's that, cushion of oil um, obviously it gets thinner when it gets hotter there's going to be that's going to get squished out by the up and down movement of the com rods um, and the bearing's going to heat up in areas then all that's going to happen is the bearing's just going to seize onto the journal sp um, spin the bearing it's knackered one of the rods um, and that's exactly what has happened guys with this particular engine so just an example um, so yeah two things really it's very important that you get your clearances right through either experience or just go by the book. Um, and secondly, make sure when you're looking at measurements in a book, one decimal place in engineering terms is a country mile and it could end up like this. So, um, so yeah, hope you've learned something by that guys. If not, comment down below and I'll explain in a little bit more to detail anything you need me to. Well, thanks a lot for watching guys. That's all we got time for today until hopefully tomorrow's video. Um, have a great evening, we'll see you then. Cheers, guys.